Welcome to our series of programs titled America's Foundations Raised and Raised. Today we're going to be talking about America's future, the foundations raised and raised. Hopefully you have already watched the first program where we talked about America's past, the foundations raised and raised. And when we say raised, R-A-I-S-E-D, talking about raised up. When we say raised, R-A-Z-E-D, that's talking about raised down, torn down. So today we're going to be talking about America's future, its foundations raised and raised. Real quickly, let's review the previous program. Again, hopefully you've already looked at that one. If not, please look at that one first and then come back to this. But from the previous program, I asked the question, did El Shaddai bless wicked ancient Israel and wicked modern America? And the answer is yes. Second question, why did El Shaddai bless the wicked nations of Israel and America? And the two answers primarily are, Number one, God wants to give people time to repent. The scripture that says the goodness of God is meant to lead us to repentance. So God blesses so that he gives people time to repent. The second reason, though, is frankly to prove that even with all physical blessings, nations will fail. And that's because a nation doesn't have God in them, each of the leaders and the people having God in them through the power of the Holy Spirit. God may be with a nation as he was with Israel, guiding them, blessing them, as he has been with America, guiding, blessing America. But because people have not truly repented and received the gift of salvation, received the gift of the Holy Spirit so that God can be in them, they still will not repent and turn to righteousness. And then another question, what are, or in one case, were the three symbols of America's prosperity, power, and policies? The three symbols, as it pertains to prosperity, the first symbol was the World Trade Center, all seven buildings, not just the Twin Towers, although that was the most spectacular part. But the World Trade Center consisted of seven actual buildings. The second symbol of uh, of America's prosperity and power, the power is the second symbol, is the Pentagon, because that's where all of our war departments are focused, and defense departments. And then uh, when it comes to the third symbol, it has to do with policies, and that obviously emanates out of the Capitol, out of Washington, D.C., so that has to do with the White House slash Capitol. And then a fourth question, when and how were the first two symbols raised up and then raised down? Well, the first symbol, which is the symbol of prosperity, the Twin Towers, and the other five buildings, of course, they were raised down on September 11th of 2001. But when, were, when was our foundation of prosperity actually raised up? Well, interestingly, that also happened on September 11th, but it was September 11th of 1609 when Henry Hudson discovered Manhattan Island and made it a world trading post. Well, what about the second one, our symbol of power, the Pentagon? Well, that was actually raised down to the ground also on September 1st or September 11th, sorry, September 11th of 2001. Well, when was it raised up? It was raised up also on September 11th, and that was September 11th of 1941. So there's no coincidence there that both of those aspects of America's preeminence in the world, our prosperity and our power, were raised up on September 11th. Prosperity raised up on September 11th of 1609. Power raised up on September 11th of 1941, and both were raised down on September 11th of 2001. So that is no coincidence that those dates 
coincide. It is God saying that my hand is in this. I blessed you, but now I'm removing the blessings and I'm causing curses to come upon you. And definitely allowing a nation to attack us, terrorists, is a curse on America because our walls of defense were breached and literally the walls of the Pentagon were uh, breached. And of course, the walls of the Twin Towers and the other five buildings totally collapse back to its foundation. And then we have a fifth question. What was the intended target of the plane that crashed into a field? So on September 11th, we know two different planes crashed into the two different uh, towers at the World Trade Center. And then a third plane, <coughs> excuse me, uh, crashed into the Pentagon. But there was a fourth plane. And what was the intended target of that fourth plane that ended up crashing into a field? Well, the intended target was the Capitol, either the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., or the White House itself. And that's the third aspect of our preeminence is the place where our policies for our nation emanate from. And that is from the White House and from the Capitol. So the question is, in connection with the third symbol, which is the White House slash Capitol, what is the significance of the number 19? Because God said, I'm going to allow the first two symbols to be raised down to the ground on September 11th of 2001, but I'm going to forestall the attack on the Capitol until a later time. So God was, again, giving people time to repent. God, first and foremost, wants to bless people so that we come to repentance and then walk in righteousness, which is keeping all of God's commandments, all 10 of them, in the letter and spirit of the law. But when that doesn't work, God says, okay, I'm going to start to take away some of your blessings, and I'm going to introduce some curses, because maybe that will get you to repent and turn to righteousness. Well, that's what God was doing by allowing that fourth plane that was supposed to strike the third target, he allowed that to crash into the field. So in connection with that third symbol, the White House, the Capitol, what is the significance of the number 19? So we're gonna answer that because God waited and said, I'm going to allow the Capitol to be attacked at a certain time. All right, so when it comes to the World Trade Center, we see the prophecy in Deuteronomy 28, and we already covered this in our previous program, but Deuteronomy 28, verses 16 through 19, talking about that this World Trade Center, which is the symbol of our economic power, that's going to be knocked down. We would be cursed. That's exactly what happened. Then you see in Deuteronomy 28 also, verse 25, 49, and 52, talks about the Pentagon and that being struck down. Again, please go and listen to part one of this series, America's Past, was where we talk about the foundations raised and raised. And now we come to the third symbol, the White House or the Capitol. And let's look at this one. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 20 through 21. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 20 through 21. And then we'll read verse 45. Here it says, Yahweh will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you put your hand to do. And isn't that a fitting description of our politics in this nation, where there's so much confusion, so much division. And right now, Congress has an approval rating of about 21%. Most people literally despise our government because it is so broken it is almost non-functional. It says, um, so I'm going to send cursing on you, confusion and rebuke in all that you put your hand to do until you are destroyed and quickly perished. Why? Because of your evil doings by which you have forsaken Yahweh. And of course, this government for years has never been righteous, but for years has really been striking at the foundation of the Bible itself and of biblical principles. So it says, because of your evil doings, I'm going to send these curses on you. Verse 21. Now, this is very, very interesting. And again, no coincidence. 
He will make the pestilence. Now, is COVID-19, I asked the question, what does 19 have to do with the third symbol, which is our democracy, the Capitol and the White House? What does the number 19 have to do with this third symbol, the foundation of it being stricken? Well, COVID-19 is the first answer. There's two answers. COVID-19 is the first answer. He says he will make the pestilence, and COVID-19 is indeed a pestilence, and it has affected America more than any other nation. We have over 600,000 people who have died from COVID, and the number just continues to rise. After us, it's Brazil, and then India, and then some other countries. But America, unfortunately, is at the top of the heap, where we should be at the bottom, where, where virtually no one uh, died from this pestilence. But because of a botched response to it, that's why so many people have died. And this botched response is God's doing because he said he would send cursings on this nation because of our politics, our policies are so broken. They're so far from Yahweh. She says he will make the pestilence cling to you until he has consumed you from off the land. And now dropping down to verse 45, all these curses will come on you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed. Why? Because you are wicked. Yes, God has blessed wicked ancient Israel. He has blessed wicked modern America, but the blessings are being withdrawn. Curses are allowing, God is allowing curses to overtake this country until this country is destroyed. So the first symbol went down September 11th, 2001. The second symbol went down on September 11th of 2001. And what about the third symbol, the White House? When was that foundation struck? Well, here's, again, something that's extremely interesting. You're not going to find this understanding in very many places. So what did COVID-19 have to do with striking democracy? The first cases of the coronavirus disease, COVID-19, were reported in the United States in January 2020. Because President Trump botched the response, his reelection became perilous. In response, this is what he did. This is taken from an article in the BBC that was published on July 30th of 2020. And I want you to keep that date in mind, July 30th, 2020, because it has significance just like September 11th in terms of the foundation of democracy being raised up and the foundation of democracy being struck, raised down, okay? So July 30th, very important date. So this is a July 30th, 2020 BBC article titled, Donald Trump suggests delay to 2020 US presidential election. And notice how it is involving COVID-19. So Mr. Trump appears to be doing everything in his power to undermine the credibility of November's vote, in which a record number of Americans are predicted to rely on mail-in voting to avoid the risk of exposure to the coronavirus, i.e. COVID-19. He's repeatedly made false and misleading claims about the reliability of the mail balloting and suggested broad conspiracy theories. Critics warn that he could be laying the groundwork for contesting the results although the purpose may be simply to give him a scapegoat if he loses. We all wish that it was that benign. Unfortunately, it was much more insidious than that. So another article, this was September 23rd of 2020. This is in the Washington Post. This article is titled, Trump won't commit to a peaceful transfer of power if he loses. So President Trump refused Wednesday to commit to a peaceful transfer of power if he loses the election, asserting that if he doesn't win, 
it will be because of fraudulent mail-in voting. Trump continues to claim with no evidence that Democrats are supporting widespread mail-in voting, not for public health reasons, the COVID-19 pandemic, but to corrupt or commit fraud in the election. So notice again, God allowed COVID-19 to strike this country and strike this country the hardest as a curse. And because COVID-19 was here ravaging so many lives, the president, President Trump at the time, he had decisions and he just botched the response. Even his one of his assistants, one of the chief people, Deborah Birch, recently mentioned that over 100,000 people needlessly died because of the president's wrong decisions and frankly, foolish decisions, evil decisions. And then a third article, this is a January 6, 2021 New York Times article titled, Be There, Will Be Wild, Trump All But Circled the Date. Here it reads, on December 19th, Mr. Trump tweeted, big protests in D.C. on January 6th. Be there, will be wild. For weeks, President Trump and his supporters have been proclaiming January 6th of 2021 as a day of reckoning, a day to gather Washington to save America and stop the steal of the election he had decisively lost but maintained he had won. And then on January 6th of 2021, when the electoral college votes were being certified, Donald J. Trump, president of the United States of America, incited an insurrection against the very country he had sworn to protect and defend. Now, these are not my words. These are words of world leading figures. Politicians all over the world, of course, politicians even here in America, are talking about this was an insurrection, this was a coup attempt, and this was something that was led by the sitting president, Donald J. Trump. So this is not a political message, but we're talking about policies because we're talking about our democracy. And it is the White House and Congress that sits in the Capitol that determine the laws that govern our country. And so again, if it was a Republican president, a Democratic president, an independent president, doesn't matter. All governments in the United States have been wicked from its inception. All governments in every country all over the world, including ancient Israel, and yes, even modern day Israel are completely wicked. And God is allowing us through our own human efforts to write the lesson that we cannot get things right. We will not repent of our sins and walk in righteousness. And so God is allowing this leading nation of America to be, in a sense, the example, the negative example of a city on a hill. We are a city on a hill, but not shining a light. We are in darkness. We are showing the world how to go into darkness, how to totally blow it having all blessings and we totally blow it and we bring upon ourselves curses. And the only solution, my friends, is Jesus the Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, when he returns to this earth, his second coming, and he inaugurates the kingdom of God here on earth where he teaches nations to beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, where the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. That's when people will turn to the Messiah for salvation and for transformation. That's when we will have this utopian society where everyone will walk in peace and prosperity. It is only the government of God that can do that. No man-made government can do that. And so we see right before our eyes our American government that is falling apart, and God is allowing curses allowing us to bring curses upon ourselves. So listen to these descriptions. It's not me. This, again, is not something political. We're just stating the facts. And listen to what other people have said, including world leaders. 
We're gathered together in the heart of our nation's capital for one very, very basic and simple reason, to save our democracy. We have hundreds of thousands of people here, and I just want them to be recognized by the fake news media. Turn your cameras, please, and show what's really happening out here, because these people are not going to take it any longer. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Our country has had enough. We will not take it anymore. We will stop the steal. We will not let them silence your voices. We're not going to let it happen. They've used the pandemic as a way of defrauding the people. We want to go back and we want to get this right because we're going to have somebody in there that should not be in there and our country will be destroyed and we're not going to stand for that. For years, Democrats have gotten away with election fraud. Republicans are constantly fighting like a boxer with his hands tied behind his back. It's like a boxer. And we want to be so nice. We want to be so respectful of everybody, including bad people. And we're going to have to fight much harder. But just remember this. You're stronger. You're smarter. You've got more going than anybody. And they try and demean everybody having to do with us. And you're the real people. You're the people that built this nation. You have to get your people to fight. And if they don't fight, we have to primary the hell out of the ones that don't fight. And our election was so corrupt that in the history of this country, we've never seen anything like it. Why wouldn't they let us verify signatures in Fulton County, which is known for being very corrupt? They won't do it. They go to some other county where you would live. I said, that's not the problem. The problem is Fulton County, home of Stacey Abrams. You know what the world says about us now? They said, we don't have free and fair elections. And you know what else? We don't have a free and fair press. Our media is not free. It's not fair. It suppresses thought. It suppresses speech. And it's become the enemy of the people. It's become the enemy of the people. It's, a, it's the biggest problem we have in this country. We will not be intimidated into accepting the hoaxes and the lies that we've been forced to believe. Over the past several weeks, we've amassed overwhelming evidence about a fake election. We have come to demand that Congress do the right thing to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. We're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you, and I'm going to be watching, because history is going to be made. We're going to see whether or not we have great and courageous leaders or whether or not we have leaders that should be ashamed of themselves and you know what if they do the wrong thing we should never ever forget that they did never forget we should never ever forget the republicans have to get tougher you're not going to have a republican party if you don't get tougher they want to play so straight they want to play so sir yes the united states the constitution doesn't allow me to send them back to the states. Well, I say, yes, it does. And we got to get rid of the weak Congress people, the ones that aren't any good. That's going to be the end of the Republican Party as we know it, but it's never going to be the end of us, never. Let them get out. Let, let the weak ones get out. This is a time for strength. The radical left knows exactly what they're doing. They're ruthless, and it's time that somebody did something about it. Make no mistake, this election was stolen from you, from me, and from the country. As this enormous crowd shows, we have truth and justice on our side. We have overwhelming pride in this great country, and we have it deep in our souls. And we fight. We fight like hell. You want to fight? You better leave. You got more. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Yeah. 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 Oh! 
Okay, so that was the first video. We have a second video to show you, which basically is saying some similar things, although it adds some more really disturbing uh, truths to what happened on that day. And you see the confusion, you see the rioting, you see the destruction, you see uh, police being violated, and you heard the multiple lies being told where no election was fraudulent, all of the fraudulent uh, lawsuits brought about in various states have been thrown out or proven to be fraudulent. So a whole bunch of lies, a whole bunch of destruction, anger, uh, the spirit of murder there. There's so many sins that were committed on that day, and God is allowing these curses to come upon our nation. So we have a, another video which confirms this in the mouth of two or three witnesses, Something is confirmed, so we're going to see this. Say hello, everybody. never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Our country has had enough. We will not take it anymore. And that's what this is all about. We're going to walk down to the Capitol because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. Police just announced that there was a breach. Uh, somebody or some people got into the building uh, past security, so they blocked the chamber in the house and they blocked the chamber in the Senate. They broke the glass. Everybody stay down. Get down. Shots are being fired Everybody inside the Capitol down. chamber. Everybody down. Everybody down.
this hour, our democracy is under unprecedented assault. The words of a president matter. At their best, the words of a president can inspire. At their worst, they can incite. This was a fraudulent election, but we can't play into the hands of these people. We have to have peace. So go home. We love you. You're very special. To those who strove to deter us from our responsibility, you have failed. To those who engaged in the gleeful desecration of this, our temple of democracy, American democracy, justice will be done. Okay, so in that video, you saw uh, two comments that I want to highlight, President elect Biden saying that our democracy is under an unprecedented attack. And then Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, saying that the rioters did not deter the lawful execution of their duties and that justice will come upon those who desecrated that Capitol building. So very interesting to keep those two things in mind. And now here's a video clip about world leaders talking about how despicable this attack on democracy was. Chaos in the heart of Washington, D.C. This morning, a world that has looked to American democracy is looking on in horror. The angry final days of Donald Trump's presidency. British television viewers watching as rioters, one even wearing a Camp Auschwitz shirt, held up a trophy from Nancy Pelosi's office. Europeans this morning shell-shocked in London. It's outrageous, disgusting. That's when you have an idiot for a president, right? And in Paris. Needs the kind of shocking because, I mean, it's a, a center for the democracy. Tear gas. A tear gassed reporter from Turkey, which saw a 2016 attempted coup, stunned by what she was witnessing. I've never seen anything like this. Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel, Europe's most powerful politician, condemning President Trump personally for not conceding defeat. And overnight, a roll call of unprecedented statements from European leaders urging America's president to respect the election. The British Prime Minister tweeting, it's now vital there should be a peaceful and orderly transfer of power. The French president recording a video statement. We believe in the strength of our democracies. We believe in the strength of American democracy. The Secretary General of NATO, formed when America saved Europe from fascism, calling yesterday's images shocking. The UN Secretary General, saddened. America's international allies, outspoken. Australia's leader, condemning the riots. Terribly concerning. While New Zealand's Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, devastated. Even some of President Trump's closest friends around the world not holding back. The rampage at the Capitol yesterday was a disgraceful act and it must be vigorously condemned. While America's foes reveling. One Russian politician comparing these scenes with revolution in Ukraine. China's Global Times claiming the bubble of democracy has burst. While Israel's defense minister writing, the pictures from Washington hurts the hearts of everyone.
And just think about this, Savannah. You normally hear statements from places like Downing Street advocating for democracy directed at countries like Russia and China. For a statement like that to be directed at America from Downing Street, the home of Churchill, well, it is unprecedented in history, Savannah. So here you see the word unprecedented used again. And you see that the leader of China said that the bubble of democracy has burst. And you saw the Israeli prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, say that it has to be vigorously condemned what happened. And then you see these uh, papers talking about democracy attacked, failed insurrection, under siege, the capital under siege. This is what happened, and I want all of us to understand the gravity of it, because American democracy, which is the beacon for any country that seeks liberty, it was almost destroyed. The foundation was attacked. It was almost destroyed. There were literally only about 10 or so people, some federal judges and some people who govern elections within states that stood in the way of this big lie of stop the steal from really being able to overturn the election. And it would have totally destroyed our democracy. We've never had anything like that before. So this is something that was extremely serious. America's democratic foundation was attacked, but not by foreign terrorists. It was struck by domestic terrorists led by Donald Trump. And it began 19 years after September 11, 2001. So this is the second time that we see the number 19. We know that the number 19 was associated with COVID, COVID-19. And COVID-19 struck our country in 2020. And because COVID-19 struck our country and the president saw because of his botched handling of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic that his poll numbers started to really tank and he feared he was gonna lose the election. So he came up with conspiracy theories and big lies to say, the only way that I can lose is if it's a fraudulent election. Unfortunately, literally, tens of millions of people believed that lie and still believe that lie. And our democracy was attacked. Now, this happened 19 years after September 11, 2001. So we have COVID-19, and God is sending us a message with this number 19. COVID-19 happened. The president botched the response. His poll numbers tanked. So he started a lie, a big lie, talking about it'd be a fraudulent election. It was stolen. So American democracy was attacked and it had to do with COVID-19 and the president's botched response to that. And it happened to be, and when I say happened to be, this was God orchestrating it. It happened to be 19 years, our democracy being attacked, 19 years after the first two symbols of our global preeminence was struck. So on September 11th of 2001, you had our economic dominance struck when the World Trade Center was struck. You had our military dominance struck when the Pentagon was struck. And then when a plane was supposed to strike either the Capitol or the White House, God said, no, I'll allow it to crash into a field because I wanna wait for 19 years to see if Americans will truly repent of their sinful ways and turn to me and walk in righteousness, keeping all of my commandments. Unfortunately, that did not happen. And so 19 years later, God allowed COVID-19 to be introduced so that the third symbol of our American preeminence and dominance would be struck, and that is our democracy. And literally, the U.S. Capitol was struck by domestic terrorists 
led by Donald Trump. So very interesting, the number 19. But we're not finished with the number 19 yet. Is there a 19-year time cycle precedent in Israel? This is both ancient Israel and modern Israel. The answer is yes. Is there a 19-year time cycle precedent in Israel? The answer is yes. From 606 BC to 587 BC, which is 19 years, something very interesting happened. From the time that Nebuchadnezzar took control of Israel until the time that he took control of Jerusalem was 19 years. In 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 1, it says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded Judah and made Jehoiakim, king of Judah, his servant. And then in 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 8 through 9, it says, 19 years later, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, sent Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, to Jerusalem. He burned Yahweh's house, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. So what happened here was God sent an initial striking against the house of Judah. And that initial striking happened in 606 BC when Nebuchadnezzar invaded the land of Judah, the land of Israel. And he took it over. He took control of it. But he didn't take control specifically of Jerusalem, which, of course, was the capital of of Judah. But because Israel did not repent and turn to Yahweh to serve him in righteousness, God said, I'm going to send a second striking, and I'm going to do it 19 years later. And so he sent uh, Nebuzaradan under the orders of Nebuchadnezzar to go right to the capital, to Jerusalem, and to burn down the capital building, Yahweh's house, the temple that Solomon had built, plus to burn down the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. So that should kind of give us an echo of what happened on September 11 of 2001. And then 19 years later, God sending another striking. He sent an initial striking, September 11, 2001. America did not repent of its sins and turn to righteousness, keeping all of God's commandments. Instead, God said, okay, I'm going to have to send another striking. And the capital was struck 19 years later. All right, so what about for modern day Israel? That was ancient Israel from 606 BC to 587 BC. What about modern Israel? Well, from 1948 to 1967, AD is also 19 years. So again, very interesting. From the time that Jews took control of Palestine until the time they took control of Jerusalem was 19 years. And you'll notice that this was a reverse of the curse that came upon ancient Israel. In ancient Israel, they lost control of the land of Judah as a whole. But it wasn't until 19 years later that they lost control of the capital. Well, when you come to God restoring the nation of Israel, God just flipped the script, used another 19-year cycle, and he allowed the Jews to take control of Palestine, that land as a whole. But it took 19 years until they took control of the capital. And the specific things that happened on May 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion, head of the Jewish agency, proclaimed the establishment of the state of Israel. And then 19 years later, on June 10th, 1967, the Six-Day War against Egypt, Syria, and Jordan ended with Israel victorious, which led to historic reunification of Jerusalem. So we see God orchestrating the same type of thing in America using this 19-year time cycle between September 11, 2001, and when the COVID-19 the reaction from the then sitting president, Donald Trump, on July 30th of 2020, where he began to tell this big lie that the election was going to be fraudulent, which led to the insurrection and literally the attack on the Capitol on January 6th of 2021. All right, so we've finished talking about the 19 years. Now we want to talk about what scripture prescribes both ancient Israel's 
and America's, modern America's fall. There's one scripture that talks about ancient Israel's fall. And this is the northern 10 tribes of Israel. And America's following the pattern of Israel. There's only two nations that have ever been founded on the Bible. Ancient Israel was founded on the Bible. At that point, it was just the what we today call the Old Testament. Modern day America was founded on the Bible, primarily what we call today the New Testament. But of course, in America, we had access to both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So the only two nations that have ever been expressly founded on the Bible, God called an Israelite nation and he called a Gentile nation as an example. So America is a Gentile nation is following the pattern of Israel, which is obviously an Israelite nation. And in the mouth of two witnesses, God establishes something. And the testimony that both ancient Israel and modern America is offering to the whole world is we had God's blessings, but because we did not obey God, keeping his commandments in the letter and spirit of the law, because we have not done that, God has withdrawn the blessings. He's instituted curses until the curses have overcome us. The curses overcame ancient Israel. The curses are overcoming modern America, and modern America is going to fall just like ancient Israel did. But there's a specific scripture that prescribes this fall. So let's talk about this now. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 8 through 12, this is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 8 through 12 is where we're going to start. Yahweh sent a word into Jacob, and it falls on Israel. Yahweh always warns before he wounds, just like a parent is going to say, listen, if you do this, you're going to get a spanking. So Yahweh warns before he wounds. And what had happened was Pekah, king of Israel, had suffered defeat by Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria. And you can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 15, 29. Now, instead of Israel repenting and saying, why did God allow the peace that we had to be breached? Why did he allow a foreign nation to come and attack us and defeat us? Is it because we have sinned, we've turned our back on God and turned to idolatry? Okay, let us repent. Instead of that being the situation, in Israel's defiance against Yahweh, they said they would make Israel great again. And so God says, all right, you want to play that game? Verse 9, all the people will know, all the people all over the world, and you saw world leaders, people in different nations all over the world talking about how despicable it was what happened on January 6th of 2021 and what preceded it, the big lie. All the people will know, including Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in pride, and in arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with cut stone. The sycamore trees have been cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. So remember this, because we're going to come back to this. And now we have it. Isaiah 9-11. Isn't that interesting? 9-11. September 11, 2001. 9-11. This is Isaiah 9-11, no consequence. This is the perfect hand of God orchestrating world events to bring about prophecy, the fulfillment of prophecy. So in Isaiah 9-11, here's what is said. Therefore, because Israel, instead of repenting at the first striking in the arrogance of their heart, said, we will make Israel great again. Because of that arrogance, God says, therefore, Yahweh will set against Israel the adversaries of Rezin and will stir up Israel's enemies. And that's exactly what happened. You can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse 6. And this is when Shalmaneser and Sargon came in and actually took the 10 tribes of Israel captive, and we know them today as the lost 10 tribes. Of course, they're not lost to God. They're not lost to people in the Middle East, people in Africa, which is primarily where they were dispersed to. They're just lost to European nations, to the West. 
All right. And that's a whole nother story. But if you want to learn more about that, you can check out uh, various YouTube videos that we have on that subject, Israel in prophecy. So now verse 12, the Syrians and the Philistines led by the Assyrians will devour Israel with open mouth for all this Yahweh's anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So we're going to come back to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 8 through 12. On 9-11, all over the world, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 8 through 12, is read by Jews and Christians. And this is those who use the one-year Bible daily reading. If you go online and you do a search for one-year Bible daily reading, it allows people to read through the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, in one year. And every day there's a group of scriptures that people read. Well, one of those scriptures that's read on 9-11 is Isaiah 9, verses 8 through 12, which obviously includes Isaiah 9-11. So on 9-11, all over the world, Isaiah 9-11 is read by Jews and Christians. We're going to focus first on the bricks have fallen. Note, the information is paraphrased from Jonathan Kahn's book, The Harbinger 2, and this is chapter 17, the next couple of slides. The attack of 9-11 specifically involved the fall of walls and buildings, and the most iconic image in the wake of the calamity was of the heaps of ruins at ground zero, and within those ruins were fallen bricks. But we will rebuild with cut or hewn stones. After 9-11, American leaders vowed to rebuild the fallen towers. The rebuilding of Ground Zero would focus on a single tower. It was to reach a height of 1,776 feet, 1,776 feet, the number that marked the nation's birth, 1776, American independence. As in ancient Israel, America's rebuilding was to become the focal point of the nation's pride and defiance. The sycamores are cut down. On 9-11-2001, in the last moments of destruction, the North Tower of the World Trade Center began to collapse. As it plummeted to the ground, it sent forth a metal beam into the air. The beam struck a sycamore tree. It would be memorialized and become known as the sycamore of ground zero. But we will replace them with cedars. On November of 2003, a Pinacea tree, a tree in the same family as cedars, was planted in place of where the sycamore tree of Ground Zero had once stood. The tree was named the Tree of Hope as a sign of the indomitable American spirit. So again, in defiance and in arrogance, we are going to build back better. We're going to make America great again. So this tree of hope was set there as a sign of the indomitable American spirit. But what happened to that tree of hope? That tree of hope mysteriously died. Professionals were called in to see why it was sick and why it was starting to die. Nobody could figure it out. And nobody, professional horticulturists, arborists, nobody could figure out why this tree was sick and it died. But this tree of hope turned into a tree of misery and despair because it died. And that was God saying, no, 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 there is no indomitable American spirit. Just like this tree was cursed and it died, I will curse America and it will die. America will fall because of its wickedness. Very interestingly now, there's the repeating of the vow, the repeating of the vow. On 9-11 of 2004, the third anniversary of the calamity, the Democratic candidate for the vice presidency, Senator John Edwards, gave a speech in the capital city. He opened the speech with the words, the bricks have fallen, but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put in their place cedars. Now, do you think that Senator John Edwards understood when he was quoting from Isaiah chapter nine, what he was saying. Well, no, he had no idea that he was fulfilling prophecy because 
these words were spoken in defiance against God punishing ancient Israel. So he's speaking in a spirit of, hey, America's great. We'll come back better. Let's make America great again, that spirit. So he says, yeah, the bricks have fallen, but we're going to build back and we're going to build with dress stones because cut stones, hewn stones are stronger than bricks. Yeah, the sycamores have been cut down, but we'll put in their place cedars because the cedar tree is much stronger than the sycamore tree. Now, also the repeating of the vow. On August 2nd of 2012, the steel beam signed by President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama during their visit to the World Trade Center site on June 14th was installed in World One World Trade Center. It's among the final beams added to the 104-story building. On the beam, the president wrote, we remember, we rebuild, we come back stronger. He is repeating this vow that was spoken by ancient Israel in defiance against God, saying, yes, you struck us, but we're not going to pay attention to that. We're just going to forge ahead. We're going to make Israel great again. We're going to build back better. Well, the same spirit, this indomitable American spirit, instead of repenting and turning to righteousness, we're going to forsake you, God, and we're going to keep going and doing our thing. So the same vow was uttered by President Obama and written actually on that beam. We remember, just like they said, the bricks have fallen. Yeah, we remember what happened. The World Trade Center was struck. We remember that. The bricks have fallen. But we rebuild. We're going to rebuild something that's better. So this one World Trade Center was built in the place of the World Trade Center that had seven buildings. And it was built to be 1770 six feet high to commemorate America's freedom. So there's no repentance. So we remember, we rebuild, because we're going to build, as it says in Isaiah 9, and we come back stronger. We're coming back with dress stones. We're coming back with cedars instead of with sycamores or with bricks. And you can see where this is quoted from, the repeating of the vow. Also in 9-11, all over the world, People continue to read in Isaiah chapter 9. This is in verses 13 through 21. And so we'll read this, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 13 through 21. For after all this punishment, the people will still not repent. They will not seek the Lord of heaven's armies. Therefore, in a single day, Yahweh will destroy both the head and the tail. Who's the head? Who's the tail? The noble palm branch and the lowly seed. The leaders of Israel are the head. And the lying prophets are the tail. In modern day America, the leaders of America, the heads of our country, the president, vice president, speaker of the house, uh, the minority leader, and then you have your governors, your mayors, and then the lying prophets are the tail. Who are the lying prophets? It is, it, it, the lying prophets are those who use the name of Christ, saying that they are Christian, but they're lying to people because they're telling people to disobey God. For instance, you have people who call themselves Christians who are teaching from the pulpit that Christmas is something that we should celebrate, when that's a lie because Jesus was not born on December 25th. We know from history that he would have been born in September because he died when he was 33 and a half years old, a half a year, six months. So if you take the time when he died, which was in April, and you go back six months, that's going to, let's do it. If it's in April, you go back six months. So before uh, April is March, then you have February, January, December, November, October. So actually October, September, October, during the Feast of Tabernacles is when he would have been born. So you go back just six months and then 30 years before that, 33 and a half years brings you to some time in September, October, when the Messiah would have been born, not in December. So that's a lie that people teach. These lying prophets also teach 
that Jesus was crucified on a Friday and was resurrected on a Sunday. Well, the scripture in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40 says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, 72 hours, Yeshua was in the grave in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, 72 hours. You cannot get 72 hours in between a Friday evening burial and a Sunday morning resurrection. So that's a lot. Actually, he was crucified on Passover in the year in which he was crucified. That was on a Wednesday. So if you count from Wednesday, you come to the Sabbath when he was resurrected. So obviously, when the disciples came on the first day of the week, which would have been Sunday morning, he was already arisen because he had risen toward the end of the Sabbath. So that's another lie. And then you have, and this is like really bizarre, people teaching you that it's a good thing to celebrate Halloween. That Halloween is all about demonism and death. Why would any Christian want to celebrate Halloween and teach their kids to go out there? And you know what trick or treat is about. It is like, give me a treat or I'm going to play a trick on you. That's just Satan being a bully. That's what Halloween is about. Satan and the demons being a bully. Give me stuff or I'm going to whoop your tail. Basically, that's what it's about. No Christian should ever celebrate Halloween. It just bothers my mind about that. And then here's the big one is Sunday. There's nowhere in the Bible where a Christian is told that we should worship on Sunday and not on Saturday, which is the Sabbath, from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. It is the Catholic Church that changed the day, and they admit that, and they even say that Protestants, those who came out of the Catholic Church in protest, are hypocrites because Protestants say, we follow the Bible. That's why we left the Catholic Church. And the Protestants say, you don't follow the Bible because there's nowhere in the Bible that tells you that Sunday is the new day that you should be worshiping on and that you should forsake the Sabbath. We're the ones who change it. You're following what we teach. So you're really following us. And that is the truth. Protestants and Catholics, it's not to say that they're bad people, but it does say that they have lying prophets that teach lies. It's not in the Bible. So when we talk about America never being a righteous nation, it was founded in wickedness, and it has continued to be wicked. And God is withdrawing the blessings. A part of it is because people won't repent of the lies that they've been taught. And so we have God saying, unless you repent of transgressing my commandments, including the fourth commandment, which is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, people have forgotten all about the Sabbath day, and they've turned to Sunday. And it's interesting. Sunday, S-U-N, is the day of the sun, and that's what these pagan holidays are about. Ancient people worship the sun, and so that was brought into Christianity by Constantine in the 300s, and people have been following those lies ever since. So God is saying the leaders of Israel, the political people, they're the head, the leaders of America are the political heads, that's the president, vice president, on down the line. And the lying prophets are the ministers that basically stand up every Sunday and are teaching lies and that go to cemeteries. They call them sem seminaries, but they're really cemeteries because they go there to bury the truth and they come out teaching lies. And again, I'm not saying that people are evil, but even God said about Israel in Romans chapter 10, they have a zeal for God, but it's without knowledge. And that's the same thing. Many people who take on the name of Christ, who say that they're Christian, they have a zeal for Christ, but not according to knowledge. They're missing big points. Idolatry is one of them, and uh, transgressing the Sabbath commandment is another one, big ones. So anyway, for the leaders of the people have misled them. That's in verse 16, Isaiah 9, verse 16. They have led them down the path of destruction. That is why the Lord takes no pleasure in the young men and shows no mercy even to the widows and orphans, for they are all wicked hypocrites and they all speak foolishness. Now I'm going to drop, drop down to verse uh, 21. And the last part, it says, for all of what God does, his fist is still poised to strike all of the punishment, all of the curses that he sends on America and is sending on America. He's saying, I'm not going to stop 
until people repent. And if people don't repent, I'm not going to stop until America totally falls. And that's unfortunately prophesied to be our outcome. So it says his fist is still poised to strike. Now, this word fist we can use as an acronym for frequency, intensity, same time. Frequency, intensity, same time. We know that there's a frequency of calamities that are striking America, whether it's fires or floods. Also, the intensity has increased. The worst fires, the worst floods, the worst temperatures, and they're all happening at the same time. Fires and floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, all happening at the same time. But God says, so this fist is like his fist, the frequency, intensity, same time. He's telling us that things are going to get worse because we get worse as a people, further and further away from Almighty God. So now to wrap this up, on July 30th, all over the world, Romans 13 verses 1 through 2 is read by Jews and Christians. The same thing with this one-year daily, one-year Bible daily reading. So on July 30th, Romans 13 verses 1 through 2 is read by Jews and Christians. So on July 30th, in 1619, Governor Yearly of Virginia called for the first representative legislative assembly. This was the foundation of representative government in what is now the United States of America. So July 30th, I told you that date was important, and I wanted you to remember it. It's because on July 30th, in the first of the colonies, Virginia, you have this governor, Yardley, who called for the first representative legislative assembly. And this was the foundation of representative government in what is now the United States of America. Also, on July 30th of 2020, as we've all already read, President Trump began to strike at the foundation of representative government by undermining the credibility of the upcoming election in which a record number of Americans were predicted to rely on mail-in voting to avoid the risk of exposure to the coronavirus, COVID-19. He repeatedly made false and misleading claims about the reliability of the mail balloting and suggested broad conspiracy theories. He propagated the big lie and it turned into a big insurrection, a big striking at the foundation of democracy. So what does Romans chapter 13 verses one through two say? It has to do with governments, with leaders. In verse one of Romans 13, everyone must submit to governing authorities for all authority comes from God and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is actually rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. When Donald Trump and his troop of insurrectionists attempted to thwart Congress's lawful certification of Joe Biden as president-elect, they violated God's instruction here in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 2. And they will be judged according to their vile and abominable actions. In fact, America itself is being judged and it's about to be convicted. So we have a third program where we're going to talk about in prophecy when America will fall. We talked about now all three symbols, the foundations were raised, the foundations then were raised. We talked about that. We talked about the scripture that prescribed both ancient Israel's fall and modern day America's fall because Israel was founded on the Bible, i.e. the Old Testament. America was founded on the Bible, primarily the New Testament, but also kind of thrown in some stories from the Old Testament. Both governments, an Israelite slash Jewish nation and a Gentile nation, these two witnesses say the same thing. We can have God with us. We can have God blessing us, but we're going to fail because we don't have God in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we will not repent and turn to righteousness 
being obedient to God's commandments, his 10 commandments in the letter and spirit of law. So America is about to be convicted and America will fall just like ancient Israel did fall. And in our next program, we'll talk about when that prophecy will be fulfilled. Okay, so just to review and summarize this in conclusion, does Elohim bless wicked people? Yes, he does. He makes rain fall on the just and the unjust. Did Elohim bless wicked Israel? Yes, he did from the time that they entered into the promised land. And he continued really to increase the blessings until the time of Solomon. And then after Solomon, God started to withdraw the blessings until the northern house of Israel was taken captive in 721 BC. And then the southern house of Judah was taken captive in 587 BC. Did Elohim bless wicked America? Yes, he did. Right from the foundation of America, he poured out blessings. And the foundation of America was really around 1609 when Henry Hudson founded Manhattan Island, then uh, in Virginia, the first colony. And in 1619, that's when Governor Yardley uh, instituted representative legislative government. And the blessings on America really increased until the time of Ronald Reagan, when America became the only superpower when the Soviet Union was dissolved, when he said to Gorbachev, tear those walls down, and the walls that separated East Berlin from West Berlin were knocked down, the Soviet Union uh, fell apart, and America was the only superpower in the world. But of course, after that time, God began to withdraw blessings, and now more and more curses are coming upon us. So in verse uh, I mean, not verse, <laughs> but the fourth thing that we're reviewing is when America's foundation, when was America's foundation of prosperity and power raised and raised? The foundation of our prosperity and power, the first prosperity, was raised on September 11th of 1609 when Henry Hudson founded Manhattan Island and set it up as a world trading center. And then our power, which is the Pentagon, that foundation, literally the groundbreaking ceremony, occurred on September 11th of 1941. So both foundations were laid on September 11th. When were they raised? Well, both foundations were raised on September 11th of 2001, when terrorists uh, flew planes into the Twin Towers, and then they fell and knocked and destroyed knocked down and destroyed the other five. So all seven of the World Trade Center was destroyed. And then of course, the Pentagon, the walls were demolished, the outer walls, when a plane flew into that. So that's when it was raised. September 11th raised up, September 11th raised down. When was America's foundation of democracy raised up and then raised down? It was raised up in 1619 by Governor Yardley when he instituted uh, legislative assemblies, people being able to vote. So that was on July 30th, July 30th of 1619. And then on July 30th of 2020, the sitting president, Donald Trump, began to attack the foundation of, the Mer of American democracy by saying the election was going to be illegitimate, fraudulent, because he saw the handwriting on the wall that he was going to lose. Why? Because COVID-19, his botched response to that, sank his poll numbers. So that's why he hatched this idea about the big lie, which turned out on January 6th, 2021, to lead to an insurrection. And of course, COVID-19 was used to bring about the striking of American democracy 19 years after our prosperity and power, those foundations were struck. And what scripture prescribes both ancient Israel's and modern America's fall? Well, it's in Isaiah chapter 9, and specifically in verse 11. So 9, 11, Isaiah 9, 11 says that I'm going to raise up enemies against you, Israel, and they will destroy you. Well, the same thing applies to America. God is raising up enemies to America, and America will fall. And enemies of America are both domestic and international. 
So what is the main lesson Yahweh Elohim is teaching the world through the fall of ancient Israel, an Israelite nation, and the fall of modern America, a Gentile nation? These two witnesses are testifying that we cannot run governments successfully ourselves, even though we have all these blessings and even have God in us in the form of the Bible. And that is because we don't have God in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the only government that will ever be able to bring about prosperity, use its power in the right way, and have a government that works for all people where there's righteousness at the head is when Jesus the Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, returns to this earth, his second coming, and sets up the government of God, the kingdom of God here on the earth. That is the testimony of these two countries. That's the main lesson Yahweh Elohim is teaching us through the example of ancient Israel and modern America, an Israelite nation and a Gentile nation, two witnesses saying the same thing. The only solution to our problems is Jesus the Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, God himself. Well, thank you for joining us for the first two parts of this series, America's Foundation, Raised and Raised. We talked about the past. We talked about the future, which is really having to do with now. So maybe I should say the present. And then we're going to talk about the future in our next program.